American government, the judiciary. Article 3 of the United States Constitution establishes the judiciary. The United States Supreme Court is an organ of the federal court system, which operates as a separate branch of the federal government. Under the Constitution, the Supreme Court is empowered to hear all cases arising under the Constitution, under the laws of the United States, and under treaties negotiated with foreign powers and the Indian tribes. Alexander Hamilton famously noted that Congress has the power of money, the president has the power of the military, but the courts have the power of only judgment, meaning that the legitimacy of the court system rests on the wisdom of their decisions. The Supreme Court is a powerful institution. Some of its decisions have as much impact as a major act of Congress or a legacy-making decision by a sitting president. Consider, for example, the Supreme Court's decision in the Citizens United case in 2010. In it, the Supreme Court found that corporations and unions and other private groups, and by extension all independent groups, can spend virtually unlimited amounts of money during election campaigns. It declared quite definitively that one's use of money is a protected form of political speech. That decision overnight changed much in the way of what we learn and how we learn about our candidates for federal office, with independent groups now spending well over a billion dollars in each federal election cycle. But the judicial branch is bigger than the nine-person Supreme Court, which tends to get all of the focus. The judiciary is, is, includes the court, but it's not only the court. At the bottom are the federal district courts. Each of them has what's called original jurisdiction, meaning it's the first court to hear a federal case brought under federal law. Such cases are heard before a judge and jury where evidence is presented and a verdict is rendered. I'm sure you've witnessed that type of court, if not in person, then on TV and in media portrayals. There are 94 federal court districts in the United States, with at least one in each state. Larger states like Texas and California have more than one district. In many of the above, the district courts are the federal appeals courts, or as they're more often called, the federal circuit courts. Districts 94, circuits above it. These courts have appellate jurisdiction. So original jurisdiction play with the district courts throughout the United States, and appellate jurisdiction goes with the circuit courts. Appellate jurisdiction means that they can hear the appeals of cases tried previously by other courts. Appellate courts do not retry a case. It's not like someone can sue again because they didn't like the decision that they got at the district level. They don't start from scratch, asking to hear from witnesses and revisit evidence. Instead, they review previous decisions to see whether the law was applied correctly to the case. If not, the previous ruling is reversed and a new ruling is issued or a retrial can be ordered. There are 13 federal appeals or circuit courts, each with a separate geographical jurisdiction. For example, the Fifth Circuit Court handles appeals of federal district court cases originating in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. The very top of our federal system of courts is the U.S. Supreme Court, which operates largely as an appellate court. It confines itself almost entirely to reviewing cases decided by lower courts. It focuses on cases highlighting ill-defined areas of legal interpretation or decisions of immediate national concern in addition to other constitutional duties. Before I say more about the U.S. Supreme Court, allow me to briefly discuss the state courts. Because the United States is a federal system, the states have their own laws and thus their own court systems. This describes the dual nature of the U.S. judicial system dual nature. There's a federal and a state level to these courts, and they overlap. Each of these state systems has trial courts at the bottom and appellate courts at the top, including a state Supreme Court and similar structure. Cases that arise under state law must be tried in state courts. They don't overlap there. In fact, most legal cases in the United States start and end in the state court system and don't touch this federal system. Most crimes such as shoplifting or assault and battery and most civil cases such as divorce are adjudicated entirely by state and local courts. Upwards of 95% of legal cases settled in the United States are handled outside of this federal system that we're studying. Virtually the only time that a state case is heard also in federal courts when a federal issue is involved, such as when an individual convicted in a state court alleges that federal law was not followed or that their constitutional rights were violated during the case. For the rest of the session, we're going to focus only on the U.S. Supreme Court which truly decides the law of the land. Let's explore what makes the Supreme Court so unique, the law of the land, the final say. The Supreme Court has nearly full control of its docket. 
For the most part, it hears only the cases it chooses to hear, basically. Each year, about 10,000 losing parties lost a court case in the lower court petition the Supreme Court to hear their appeal. The Supreme Court only accepts about 100 of those cases, or about 1% of the requests. The case usually gets on the Supreme Court's docket or agenda. Four of the nine justices agree that it's worth taking on. When that happens, the court issues a writ of certiorari. Here it is. Which is a request to the lower court to submit the record of the case to the Supreme Court for their consideration. They look at the notes, they look at everything that was published as a result of the case. The justices never choose a routine appeal case. The court's own guidelines say that there must be compelling reasons for accepting a case at that high level. Some question or issue of notable legal significance must be at issue before the court will review a lower court decision. Otherwise, the previous decision should stand. During a 2012 term, for example, the Supreme Court accepted a case challenging components of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. The court had compelling reasons for doing so. Not only did the act affect the lives and livelihoods of millions of Americans, hundreds of millions of Americans, the constitutional challenges in the lower courts had resulted in a series of conflicted rulings among the federal circuit courts, which the Supreme Court understood it was compelled by constitutional authority to resolve. In essence, the lower courts could not themselves settle the legal disputes and debates that arose from the 1,000-page law. So it became the Supreme Court's clear constitutional obligation. When a case is heard by the United States Supreme Court, the opposing sides present their arguments to the justices, subject to questioning by those justices. After that oral arguments hearing, which are open to the public and audio recorded, you can find them online, I got to attend in person in 2019, it was incredible. The justices then meet privately to discuss the case amongst themselves. Those are oral arguments, usually an hour, sometimes two. They then vote on it and assign one of the justices to take the lead in writing what's called the majority opinion. That's the legal argument held by most or all of the justices who sided with the winning party, whoever got five of nine or more votes. Sometimes the majority, though agreeing on the decision who should win the case, kind of agree on a legal basis for that decision that they concur on or agree on. In that case, the lead opinion is called the plurality opinion the view held by most of the justices on the winning side. That's the plurality. There are two other types of opinions. One is a concurring opinion, which is a separate opinion written by a justice who votes with the winning side but disagrees in whole or in part on the majority opinion's legal argument they took to get there. Concurring opinion. I agree that this side of the lawsuit should win. However, I have a totally different perspective about why. When a judge agrees with an opinion but wants to contribute their own points to the debate, or the legal record, they write such an opinion. And we'll talk about why the legal record is so important. The other is a dissenting opinion. A dissenting opinion. In it, a justice on the losing side explains the reason for disagreeing with the majority's decision. This is common when a judge believes that the majority are ruling on a case uh, incorrectly, or rather, when they believe the majority is drawing an incorrect legal conclusion. It's not about what's right or wrong. What conclusion are they drawing? Is it steeped in the law and a previous precedent? Of these opinions, the majority opinion is most important because it serves as a precedent. There was that term. That term refers to a ruling that guides justices' decisions when faced with similar cases in the future. This academic record that is comprised of all of these different opinions becomes a case law that other justices and judges look to at all levels of government to determine how the law should be interpreted. That aforementioned Citizens United decision is an example. In it, the Supreme Court held that the ban on corporate and union election spending was a violation of the First Amendment freedom of speech. This precedent led independent expenditure groups, which are not corporations or unions, and said advocacy groups to challenge limits on the amounts they could receive from campaign contributors. In 2010, a federal appellate court, or circuit court, citing that Citizens United decision from the Supreme Court as a precedent, ruled that the contribution limits violate the First Amendment. One decision begets another, and the law becomes clearer and clearer and more ironed out over time. One of the key things to understand about the Supreme Court decisions is that they are the result of the law and legal knowledge, never the result of politics. As a court of law, the Supreme Court operates in the context of established American jurisprudence, or theories of law, jurisprudence, including provisions of the Constitution and congressional statutes, as well as the precedent set by earlier federal court rulings. They look to the past and what's been written and what's been understood and argued 
to inform the current decisions. History and tradition weigh heavily on the minds of the judges of the Supreme Court. However, the cases that reach the Supreme Court are never clear-cut legal disputes. If they were clear-cut, they would have been settled definitively by one of these lower courts. The Supreme Court hears the difficult cases, those where each side's argument has some legal merit. To boot, legislation passed by Congress in recent decades is often imprecise, and therefore not always a reliable guide for how the law should be interpreted, which has resulted in a growing number of federal lawsuits that land cases within federal court. In all of its exquisite conciseness, the United States Constitution is also inexact. The framers saw fit to rely on good judgment from those holding power rather than write a document that could answer all potential legal questions arising in this new country. Consider the Constitution's Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states. What's included in the definition of commerce, the Constitution doesn't say. What is meant by commerce among the states as opposed to commerce within the states? The Constitution is silent on that question as well. These uncertainties create room for judgment, which is where the judge's personal interpretations of the law can come into play. When the judges are divided in their opinions, which has happened in about two-thirds of the cases in recent decades, one predictor of what side a justice will end up on is their limited partisan background. Those appointed to the court by a Republican president versus those appointed by a Democratic president, for instance. As set out in the Constitution, Supreme Court justices are nominated by the sitting president and then seated on the court if confirmed by a majority vote in the United States Senate. If confirmed by the Senate, and unless they are later impeached by Congress, they enjoy life tenure on the bench, as do the federal judges in the lower courts. The Constitution specifies that judicial officers shall serve only during good behavior, and like the president, Congress holds impeachment power. Presidents tend to be very strategic in selecting their Supreme Court nominees. Opportunities to nominate judges to the Supreme Court, which only has nine members, are rare and unpredictable, given that there are only nine of them. Retirements and deaths tend to be rare and notable, uh, notable events in American history. Presidents want nominees whose views on legal disputes are likely to align with their own, both during their own tenure in office and into the future. They don't want to knowingly put someone on the court who will wind up voting against the ideals and aspirations they brought with them into office. This nearly always leads them to nominate a person with ties to their own political party, or at least to their own philosophical alignment. Not since Republican President Richard Nixon nominated Lewis Powell more than four decades ago has the president picked a nominee with ties to the other major political party in American life. Even Powell was not a typical Democrat a conservative Democrat, a product of his Virginia roots. The tendency of presidents to pick like-minded justices is not lost on those on the court who are thinking about retiring. Justices sometimes try to time their retirements from the Supreme Court and other federal courts so that their replacement is likely to be someone with a similar judicial philosophy, such as the case recently with the retirements of Anthony Kennedy, who was appointed by Republican President Ronald Reagan, who retired under Republican President Donald Trump, and Justice Stephen Breyer, appointed by Democratic President Bill Clinton, who retired under Democratic President Joe Biden, uh, maybe under a little pressure. Iconic justices like Antonin Scalia, who died in 2016, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died in 2020, passed away while actively serving on the Supreme Court, throwing the court and the Washington political establishment briefly into disarray. Supreme Court appointments have become increasingly contentious. As the divide between the American people and their political parties has widened in recent decades, court appointments have gone from mostly perfunctory affairs to emerging as a new battleground over old and new policy issues. This trend is clearly fueled by Congress's ongoing reluctance to write legislation from the political center. In the political vacuum left by Congress's intransigence, many people have looked to the court as a potential group of super legislators dangerous trend from our republic, I would argue. If Congress writes vague laws and the bureaucracy cannot create coherent policy as a result, then it is only natural for the people, the American people, to look to the court for relief because they know things are going to end up in court. It remains absolutely vital that the court maintain its neutrality and integrity. It cannot assume the powers of policymaking lest it become yet another partisan body in our government. The abortion issue offers a concerning example. Ever since the Supreme Court's 1973 Roe v. Wade decision 
Roe v. Wade. Which guarantees a woman's constitutional right to an abortion during the early months of her pregnancy. Republicans have been seeking to weaken that protection at the state and local levels. For their part, Democrats have been equally determined to expand the court's protections and increase access to abortion across the country. That central dispute was at the forefront during the 2018 confirmation hearings for Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh was President Trump's nominee to fill the vacancy created by the retirement of Justice Anthony Kennedy. In the absence of congressional leadership on issues of major controversy like abortion, political interests have looked to the Supreme Court, sometimes in fear, sometimes in hope, for absolution on the issues that matter most to them. We may say that we support the expression that justice is blind, i.e. neutral, but the Senate's confirmation process for Supreme Court nominees now attracts more political protest and hysteria than, does, than it does honest inquiry and debate over legal jurisprudence. In truth, justices are officers of a separate branch and they prize their judicial independence from politics. All Republican appointees do not vote the same way, nor do all Democratic appointees to office. There are many cases where all or nearly all of the justices, Democratic and Republican appointees alike, interpret case law and the Constitution similarly. In a landmark 2014 case, for example, the Supreme Court unanimously concluded that the constitutional protection against illegal search and seizure in the Fourth Amendment barred police in most circumstances from conducting a warrantless search of a suspect's cell phone. They issued what's called a bright line ruling, 9-0 that preserved individual liberty in alignment with the Constitution and offered clarity and limits to law enforcement. Case closed, fate settled. Judicial review refers to the power of the government. Judicial review refers to the power of a court to decide whether another governmental institution has acted within its constitutional powers, and if not, to nullify its actions. Nullification, we'll come back to that. This power was cemented in Marbury versus Madison, power was cemented in the infamous Marbury versus Madison decision to confirm the power of American federal courts to strike down laws and statutes that they find to violate the original document, the Constitution of the United States. Judicial review is the most powerful tool available to members of the Supreme Court. By applying it, the court is substituting its judgment for that of another institution, essentially issuing a judicial veto with no appeals process. But this power is not unique to America's Supreme Court. Other nations' high courts also have the power of judicial review. This power is particularly notable given the design of our Republican system of government. Few democracies divide power as thoroughly as does the U.S., between three branches and also between the state, national, and local levels. Each of these divisions is a source of potential legal dispute. Where does the constitutional power of one institution end and the other institution begin? When such disputes take legal form, the Supreme Court is positioned to decide the outcome. Ultimately, it decides how power in the American political system is to be divided. Taking the long view, even though they are entirely a reactive organ of the United States government, one could argue this power makes the Supreme Court the most powerful branch within our federal system. In addition, the U.S. constitutional system establishes a limited government, one where individuals have a host of protections, individual rights and guarantees against unwarranted action by agents of the government. The result, again, is a host of constitutional disputes over the limits of government power. And here again, the institution with the ultimate authority to decide the question is the U.S. Supreme Court. This helps explain why so many cases are petitioned to the court each year, thousands. The Supreme Court's position in deciding constitutional disputes, which are abundant in the U.S. system, is at the core of its power. So too is the fact that its rulings tend to be final. Although well, Congress can initiate a constitutional amendment to override a court decision, the amendment's process is pretty imposing. Widespread agreement would have to exist among the people and or Congress in order to override a Supreme Court decision. You would likely agree with me when I tell you that we are unlikely to achieve that level of agreement among the American people today. For its part, the Supreme Court has not issued so contentious a ruling that might qualify in at least a century. As a bit of an aside here off my script, uh, there's sort of two things that we could do if we are ever concerned that the court had too much power under this process of judicial review. One thing that presidents occasionally do, including the current president, is threaten to pack the court. 
um, add members to the court. That doesn't sound very threatening, but if the president, the sitting president, currently gets to be the one to nominate justices to the Supreme Court, you could see on just a few short months, a president could remake the court in his or her favor. Specifically, it obviously has to get through Congress or the Senate, rather. Um, but that is one thing the executive could do to try to check growing power by the Supreme Court. Uh, the thing that the people or Congress could do would be to just amend the Constitution, which has been done so infrequently. Um, the des uh, flight desecration case, Texas v. Johnson, would be an example. So if generally the American people feel like desecrating the American flag, burning it as an act of protest should be against the law, currently it's protected by court ruling through the First Amendment. One way, one way to change that would be to amend the Constitution to just make that the law of the land. The Constitution is supreme, so we could overcome the Supreme Court by actually amending the document. That's a pretty high hurdle, though, but it can be done. Back on point. As Charles uh, Evan Hughes, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court during the Depression year, said, we are under a Constitution, but the Constitution is what the judges say it is. The court's power has made it the frequent target of criticism, nearly always by those who object to its decisions. In the 1930s, the objectors were liberals, angered that the court was striking down one FDR New Deal program after another for being unconstitutional. In the 1960s, they were the conservatives, angered that the court was expanding the rights of those accused of crimes, despite the public's concerns with public morality and safety. More recently, liberals have been the court's most vocal critics again, targeting rulings such as the Bush v. Gore and Citizens United decisions, which they claim rested on twisted legal reasoning aimed at advancing a vast right-wing political agenda. The criticism, no matter whether it comes from Republicans or Democrats, does give most people pause. In a political system rooted in majority rule, a system rooted in the will of the people, why should nine justices, a tiny elite with lifetime tenure, be allowed to exercise so much power? However, the extent of the court's power is almost always overstated. Yes, the court wields considerable influence on the boundaries of constitutional authority. But no, these are not America's only policy deciders, nor are they the most important ones. The Supreme Court only acts and only can act when and where others have failed to do so. If you don't like a Supreme Court decision, think carefully about what series of events led the court to possess the power to make such a decision in the first place. Then you'll know where you should be protesting. Think about public policies such as social security, military developments, public education, foreign trade, food subsidies, I could go on for an hour with a list of policies that are largely beyond the scope of the Supreme Court. The court doesn't come into play when these policies are decided. There's also the issue of compliance with court decisions. The Supreme Court, to a large degree, depends on the cooperation of others for the Im implementation of its decisions. That cooperation is not always forthcoming. Law enforcement officers are obliged, under the court's Miranda v. Arizona decision and other rulings, to strictly uphold a suspect's constitutional rights. Most police do, some do not. One must also remember the fact that the US political system is not solely rooted in the principle of majority rule. Congress itself is so rooted, but the United States system is founded on the principle of individual rights, damn the will of the majority. Arguably, no other institution has taken the protection of those fundamental rights as seriously as the US Supreme Court. When in 1989 it upheld the burning of the American flag as a form of free speech protected by the First Amendment, it stood alone, opposed by Congress, the President, and public opinion. It stood for the U.S. Constitution, what the Constitution plainly says, and it stood with the men and women of 1776 and 1787. The issue of the court's place in our governing system and whether it has too much power is not an easy one, nor a one-sided one to contend with. But the question of the court's power is impossible to avoid when thinking about how the U.S. is best governed. It's a question worthy of your attention. As the final arbiter of our disputes, the Supreme Court is positioned to determine the meaning of the law when the other branches fail to do so. And so I say, God save the Honorable Supreme Court. <laughs>